lecture, we're talking about observers. We start with full order observers. So um, last time we talked about state feedback. And the, the concept is that we apply feedback based on measurement of all the states. We take all the states, we measure them, we put them through a state feedback gain, and we apply them as our control signal. So now we're actually talking about some control issues. Huh, imagine that. <laughs> well, in general, only a small combination of states are measured. Well, I mean, if you have a large order system, you may only measure a, a, just a few states. In general, it may be not be cost effective or maybe even impossible to measure all the states. Some, some states you just can't get in there to measure um, or just not cost effective. Oftentimes, um, the sensors are an expensive part of the system and uh, they, require, they require maintenance and so forth, calibration and so forth. So <clears throat> it may not be worthwhile to measure everything. And so, so in, the, in other words, you don't have all the states available, so you can't use state feedback. So we also might want, wish for some filtering of the states that are measured because of noise issues. And so question, a question is, can we use estimates of the states instead of the actual states for feedback? So that's the question of an observer. So given a system of this form, some non-zero initial condition or unknown initial condition, can we test whether, uh, we know that we can test whether the system is observable or not, but what is that bias? Well, in general, we know that we can find the unknown initial condition. Once we know what the initial condition is, we know exactly how the system responds and we know exact, basically what x of t is doing for all time. In general, however, we, do, we wish to detect not only the initial condition, but actually all values of t. And so if we can't actually physically measure it, can we at least estimate the values? Um, incidentally, since we know x follows a certain behavior, we can always mimic that behavior. And so here's a first stab at a, an observer or estimator. So the hat here indicates an estimate. So x hat dot. So basically this is the set of same differential equations, same A, B, C, D matrices as before. We choose zero initial conditions because we don't know what else to use in general. And uh, we know that as a system, if we, as long as we know A, B, C, and D, we know exactly how the system responds. And we even know the actual value of u that's going to be used because we're going to apply that. So we know exactly what that is. So theoretically, this should give us some value. But of course the question is, will it work? That's an important question. The other question that we'd ask is, how can we tell if it's going to work? Okay, so those are important questions. <clears throat> so if we def define the observation error, the difference between x and x hat, and we'd like to, we ideally like this to converge to zero as a signal. We define, so we examine the error dynamics. So having defined the error now, the error dynamics are the differential equation associated with the error. We differentiate this error, so we get x dot minus x hat dot. So x dot is equal to ax plus bu, x hat dot is ax hat plus bu. Notice that because we have the same u, bu term, these guys actually cancel. We can factor out a, get x minus x hat, but x minus x hat is exactly the error. So we have this differential equation. The error dot is equal to a times the error. So the solution to that differential equation is e to the at times the initial condition of the error. So if, if we start off mismatched initial conditions, notice if, if we start off with zero in, initial conditions, that is, we know what the initial conditions are, then we can start off with zero initial conditions, in which case this is going to be zero for all time. Also, if A is Hurwitz, that is, if our system is stable, then the error will go to zero as time goes to infinity, which means our, our, our error will converge to zero, which means our estimate converges to our, our original signal, and so that's a good thing. However, if A is not Hurwitz, then the error doesn't go to zero and might even blow up, which is not good, especially if we want to use that to feedback for feedback. So basically what we're saying is we want to use the states for feedback, but our knowledge of the states 
is diverging, and that's not good. So what this basically shows is that even though we know the dynamics of the system, mimicking the system dynamics is not enough. Okay, it's not enough. So we're going to now, in our second try, so the first try was just to kind of get our feet wet. Second try, we're going to mimic the behavior, but we're going to apply a correction term. So we have the same differential equation as before, but now we have this correction term, L, some, some gain L times Y minus Y hat. And so if this term is zero, then we recover back exactly our um, differential equation for our system. And so that, that's what we have. <clears throat> and But this gives us some, some uh, values to play around with in terms of working with our state. Okay, so it's, it's similar to what we had before, but this extra term basically is a correction term. If you think about the two different types of observers, the first observer and the second observer. So in the original form, our observer that was generating x hat received information from the control signal, but it didn't use actual information from the system, in particular the outputs that we're measuring anyway. So it doesn't use all available information, and as a result, we, could, we saw that in, in some situations, it, the, the estimate could actually blow up. Whereas in this corrected form, now we're actually using all the available information. And so you can expect that this is going to do better than the original form. So again, we look at the error dynamics, x dot minus x hat dot. Here's ax plus bu is x dot. x hat dot is ax hat plus bu plus our correction. So again, the BU term is going to go away. Um, y is CX plus DU. Y hat is CX hat plus DU. The DU terms are going away. And so we can factor all this out. And when we do, we get A minus LC times the error. So we now have different set of error dynamics. And in this case, our error dynamics are affected by L. And we've actually seen this matrix before when we looked at the properties of observability. So we have a different set of error dynamics, and we have this result. The stability of the error dynamics depends now upon A minus LC instead of just A. The pair AC we saw is observable if and only if the roots of this uh, characteristic polynomial are arbitrarily assignable by appropriate choice of L. So if our system is observable, I can put the, the, the roots of this polynomial anywhere I want. Okay, If AC is observable and we have a single output system, then we can use a variation of Ackerman's formula to actually compute the observer gain L to put the eigenvalues where we want. Okay, So here, QO is the observability matrix, and alpha O is the desired characteristic polynomial. And so we can do, with the, like what we did with the state feedback, we have an observer gain that we can use to put the eigenvalues of the, um, the f observer where we want them. So the type of observer we've been, we've been looking at is called a full order observer because it, it fully uh, implements um, estimates of all the states. Okay, So that's why it's called a full order observer. We'll come back and look at, at a reduced order observer in a little bit. But we have these basic results. If AC is observable, then L can be chosen to put the eigenvalues of A minus LC wherever we want. If AC is just detectable, it's not fully observable, then L can be chosen to put the eigenvalues of A minus LC in the stability region. For example, in continuous time, that would be in the left half plane. In discrete time, it would be in the um, inside the unit circle. Speaking of discrete time, we can do the same kind of thing with a discrete time observer as we did with the continuous time. So in discrete time, this is our system. Don't, in general, we may not know our initial condition. We choose this as our observer. Okay. And so this is basically the same kind of thing we had before. So notice I have actually I actually have y minus y hat in here, but it's kind of the L, the, the y hat is kind of embedded within this. And all of this stuff. So this is our observer, and we can now, again, if AC is observable, then we can put the eigenvalues of A minus LC wherever we want. 
If AC is just detectable, we can put a eigenvalues of A minus LC inside the unit circle. So we're, we're good. Now, it turns out in discrete time, we actually have something a little kind of special in this. If AC is observable, then the eigenvalues of A minus LC can all be put at the origin. Not only, um, not only inside the unit circle, but actually at the origin. In which case we have what's called a deadbeat observer. Okay, so the concept of a deadbeat system means it's, it's just right on. And so we actually, this is the formula for the deadbeat observer here, a to the n, uh, basically ensures that our our resulting um, our resulting um, closed loop uh, a minus l c is a nil potent matrix. So that's that's what that's what all this is going to do for us. So in discrete time, we have that. It, it turns out there's actually a second form for the observer. The form that I've shown is called the a priori observer. There's also an a posteriori observer. We won't go into that, but there is another form of the observer. So by way of summary, the observer defined that we've just been looking at both in continuous and discrete time is called a full order observer because it, the order of the observer is the same as the order of the plant which can be inefficient to implement, especially if the plant is of high order. Now, this used to be a bigger problem when computers didn't have so much memory. Now, it's not that big of a deal, but, it, you know, it is something to consider. So, this is the full order observer problem. Stay tuned. We're going to talk about a reduced order observer.